Welcome back to Tada 3D Printing. So we've received quite a few updates on the Prusa XL, including more info on shipping. The Input Shaper Alpha for the XL has finally released. The, there is a Prusa Slicer 2.7 Alpha, new G-code format, and more. My day one five tool head Prusa XL has shipped and I should have it here this coming week. I already have the single tool head, so I want to work on the input shaper to see if I can get better speeds with that. The GitHub website has a lot of information about this alpha firmware and what's all included. If you are looking for the input shaper for the XL, I would not start with installing the firmware. What I would recommend is to start in Prusa Slicer and to look at your profiles and see what prints will improve and how much they will improve with this adjustment. And the reason that I say that is because the mini input shaper, I was extremely underwhelmed with. A lot of my prints, I would save 20 minutes on a six hour print. It was not a huge difference like it is on the Mark IV. So that's where I'm gonna start in Prusa Slicer. And I feel like this is where I see a lot of questions online as well, because they feel like they have the right program, but they're not seeing the right profiles. To get Input Shaper on the Prusa XL, you need to have at least Prusa Slicer of 2.6.1 or newer. So the 2.6.1 is a stable firmware and the 2.7 that was just launched is an alpha. Either one works. I personally am not going to install the alpha. I'm happy with my stable version, so I'm going to just install more profiles, more printers on that, and I'm going to walk you guys through that. If you do not already have 2.6.1, then you will need to download that one. This is the link. I'll have all the links in the, in the description below. You just click the download for Windows, Mac, whatever you have. Or if you would prefer to just jump to the alpha 2.7.0, this is the link for this, and I'll have this linked below as well. This one I always seem to find harder to find the alphas because they're not really linked on the regular website. You have to find them on the GitHub and then you have to scroll to the bottom of the post and find the assets. Hopefully your computer doesn't take as long to load like mine does and then the assets will list it. You'll have your Windows or Mac or other options as well. Whether you're downloading a new Prusa Slicer or you already have the correct version, you will notice that when you open your settings, your different printers, you have a lot of options there. I do have input shaping listed for the Mark IV as well as the Mini because I've already included those, but as you can see, I only have the Prusa XL in the different nozzles. I'm not seeing the input shaper yet. So what I have to do is at the bottom, I click add or remove printers, and then I click it again, add or remove printers, and it's gonna give me a prompt that there is an update configuration, and I wanna say yes, because then it's gonna pull in the more updated ones that I can add. Once that goes through, another screen will pop up and you'll see all of your profiles that you already have. So I have on my Mark IV, I have Input Shaper and I have Regular, you can see the difference. And that one on the Mark IV is a stable version, so that's why it looks a little bit different. I don't have any Mark 3.9s, so I will skip this one. For the Mini, I have both the Regular Mini and the Alpha clicked for .4 nozzle. And then on the Mark III, I have multiple ones because I have the MMU III as well. And that reminds me that I actually had too many clicked. I've not been using the .6 nozzle on my Mark IV regular, so I'm going to unclick that one just to kind of clean up the space a little bit. And then after all of the Mark III's, here we are. We've got the XL. I only have a single tool head, so I need to click this button to add the input shaper. I'm just going to keep it at the default nozzle for now. And the next section is for either the multi-tool for the XL, either the two tool head or the five, which I will be clicking very soon. And that's all I need to do. I'm going to click finish. Once this loads, it'll update all of your printers. So now you have the option for input shaping. And I think that this is great even if you do decide to go ahead and do the firmware because you can jump back and forth. You, you're not stuck with the input shaping. So if you decide that it doesn't work or it doesn't work for certain prints, you don't have to use it all the time. So I'm gonna click the regular one for now. I have a large print that I'm anxious to get going. This is a custom garage room box for someone and I'll go into the details about that for in, an, in another video. But this 
um, room box is going to take quite a while. So I want to see what the difference is in input shaping. So I just clicked the regular um, profile to start with, what it just kind of defaulted to. And with all of those settings, this print would take a little over two days, two days and 11 hours. So a very long time, longer than I would like. But that is just the default on the, without input shaping. I don't usually run it at 0.2 layer height. I usually click at least the 0.3 quality. And these square ones, I have been changing to the gyroid infill. It seems like I have a little bit better luck with warping on the gyroid infill. So my true kind of default before doing input shaping, I'm gonna be looking at about an, a day and eight hours. Now we can jump to the input shaping and I have kind of a basis of what it will really be like. And I wanna keep my infill that I'm used to so that I can compare it as close as possible. And just making that shift to the input shaper, it's gonna cut off quite a bit. We're gonna be at about 22 hours. So that cuts off quite a bit because we were at a day seven and a half, so let's say a day eight. And so that's about 10 hours faster. And that's about a third faster. I honestly didn't expect it to be that good. So I think I'm gonna move forward and try this print out. So the next thing is gonna be getting the firmware. So I jump back to the GitHub for the firmware release and I scroll all the way to the bottom and open the assets. And for the Prusa XL, we wanna make sure that we're downloading that one. There is other firmware listed. Then once it's downloaded, we need to move it onto a USB to put it on the printer. So I grabbed a fresh USB, I jump into my downloads and I copy this and then I jump over to my USB. There's nothing on it and I paste it there. It goes very fast. Then I plug the USB into my Prusa XL and I was thinking that it would automatically recognize it, but it doesn't. So while I still have the USB plugged in, I turn off the power give it a few seconds, and then I turn it on again. Once it loads, it brings up a screen asking if I want to flash, and you can skip it if you don't want to do that. So I click flash and wait for this to go through the entire process. This whole thing takes my printer about four minutes to update and then reset. Then I get a screen that says to please complete calibration and test before using the printer. I click OK. And usually I'm too antsy to do any more tests, but I'm going to follow the instructions and I go to control and then I scroll, scroll down to calibration and tests. I click the first one. I already have them all green from before, but I'm going to go through them again. So I click the fan test, the first one, and it'll go through this process. The fan test took about 30 seconds. And once it finishes, it asks if I want all of the other tests to be done. I click continue because of course I do want to run through all of them and then I can focus on something else while it's going. I don't have to click next on each individual test. The next couple tests take about a minute and a half, but then I need to help it because it's going to do the load cell test. And of course that's the one that you have to touch the nozzle. So you do still have to kind of keep an eye on it as it's going through all this. And then the next steps end up taking about two minutes or so. But for some reason on my nozzle heater check, it didn't do very good. I have a couple of X's that you can see there and that doesn't change as it goes through. So when I finish up all of my tests, I did not pass that one. So I have green checks all along the top, but that last heater test has an X. So I click that one again and just run it again to see what happened. If I'm gonna continue getting an error with this. And retesting it took almost six minutes. So I don't know if maybe it had to completely cool down before it could start again. It seemed like it took longer the second time than the first time. But it does go through and I get checks all the way across. So I'm gonna go ahead and move forward with that. I hope that that was just a fluke the first time and we'll see. So I click quit and I have green checks all the way down. I export my garage room box onto the USB and add that and it pulls up fine. Seems like the screen and everything's working. I'm not getting any glitches. That looks like the correct amount. So I click print. I get my camera set up so that I can watch this remotely 
and then I check back after about an hour and the first layer is looking a little bit rough just towards the back there it doesn't look quite solid and it's only on the back the front looks good it's not too bad to stop it so I'm going to keep going with it and see how it turns out let me know your thoughts let me know if you are going to be using the input shaper and what you are planning to use it for thanks for watching